Hello and welcome to Mental Awakening, the podcast that explores all topics related to trauma recovery, mental health, chronic pain, and healing. I'm your host, Sarah DeKeely, psychotherapist and mental health social worker. And in this episode, I want to talk to you guys a bit about the anxiety and the fear that many of you may be experiencing around the pandemic and COVID and even just the uncertainties that we're all faced with at this particular point in time. Before we get into that topic, I just want to acknowledge and thank everybody for your patience because I haven't been able to post regular podcast episodes um, in the last couple of months. And the reason for that is because I have gone through a separation from my partner and you know, had a lot to to deal with practically, including, you know, moving into a new home. So there was a lot happening for me um, towards the end of last year, letting go of certain, I guess, people and places and a brand new chapter, basically. And so besides learning to deal with the pandemic and the uncertainties that came with that, I also had to embrace uncertainty in my personal life. So this topic of facing fears and anxieties and uncertainty is something that I feel, I wouldn't say comfortable with, but I feel like I've had so much experience in this area in my life that I've reached a point where I'm embracing it. I once heard the Dalai Lama say, What will happen after you die? They asked him. And he responded, I don't know, but I hope and pray I'm reborn wherever there is most suffering. It's a very interesting response because we live in a society where most of us are trying to reach certainty. We want the easy way of living. And yet this way of living has led to a lot of unhappiness for many people. People tend to isolate themselves from the outside world. They entertain, you know, thoughts of anger, thoughts of envy, meaninglessness, fear and sadness. And all of these things, they tend to start in the mind, which is pretty much the place where disease takes form or the state of dis-ease, which is also where anxiety resides. If we actually think about it, as children, most of us absolutely loved and embraced uncertainty. You know, think about your five-year-old self. Do you think that he or she wanted to have every part of their day mapped out and planned down to the minute? I don't think so. And so, as we become conditioned, we tend to become more fearful. And as adults, we disconnect ourselves from our hearts and from our spirit and from that childlike wonder and quality and, you know, that inner call for freedom and expression. All of those things go unanswered. We ignore the signals that tell us that, you know, we may be in the wrong relationship or the wrong job or, you know, whatever it could be, because we value comfort and certainty over living truthfully and expressing ourselves fully. And then we wonder why we're getting sick, why we're getting depressed and anxious, and why we're feeling unfulfilled. It's the courage of embracing uncertainty that helps us discover the truth. So I want to share a quote with you guys. Joseph Campbell, and if you haven't watched um, a really great documentary called Finding Joe, you can find it for free on YouTube by Joseph Campbell or about Joseph Campbell's work. Please do. Please look it up. He once said, opportunities to find deeper powers within ourselves comes when life seems most challenging. I truly believe that. If I just share with you guys about my most recent experience of separating from my partner and it was you know it was really unsettling and really uprooting for me 
were a lot of emotions and my family doesn't live, you know, they're not here. They're all based overseas. My best friends are based interstate. So it's really hard for me to go through this change without too much of a support around me. So I had to be my own pillar of strength and support. I had to feel and find that sense of center from within myself. And this is what I believe Joseph Campbell meant with this quote, that opportunities to find deeper powers within ourselves comes when life is most challenging. Because the challenge of going through this uncertainty really helped me to dive deeper within myself. I meditated twice a day. I had to slow way, way down. I had to revisit my thoughts, question some of my unhelpful beliefs. And I also had to incorporate certain practices like sitting with discomfort sitting with anxiety, sitting with fear and allowing it to be there and then learning and practicing to self-soothe, to treat my fears and my worries and my discomfort like a child and comfort them, you know, from this compassionate, loving self that I believe we all have within us. It takes practice to strengthen those parts of ourselves because we weren't taught how to do that from a young age. But I truly believe that this is what this current time is asking of us. The spiritual effect of this pandemic outbreak is being neglected. I mean, we don't talk about it, right? It's not something that you hear about on the news. Spiritual well-being is alien to so many people's lives. And People think that spiritual well-being is about religion, and it's got nothing to do with religion. It's actually, it's got nothing to do with any, anything other than your relationship with yourself and your relationship with life. I think what we need to do when it comes to this current time of dealing with the fears around pandemic and COVID is to, first of all, recognize that everyone's experiencing them. You know, everyone's experiencing these fears in one way or another, whether they're suppressing it, denying it, coping through avoidance behavior. And yet I really do believe that everyone's facing them. So what can we do? How can we improve the state um, of fear? I really believe that having a sense of meaning and purpose is important. I'm so grateful for my work as hard as it can be sometimes to hold space for people's pain. It's definitely helped me and continues to help me to feel incredibly connected to humanity as a whole. Learning to love and to be loved by starting with loving ourselves. One thing that helps me with that is giving approval to things. I'll give you guys an example. When my body is not feeling the best, I actually tell myself, I approve of this. When I'm feeling mentally, physically, or emotionally exhausted, run down, whatever is, ha whatever is happening, it could be like chaos happening in my life, and I still tell myself, I approve of this. Because approval is the first step towards love, true love. And love is the state where healing resides, where healing takes place. So even if we look at it from the perspective of getting to a place where you feel more safe from within yourself or feel more confident within yourself, feel a sense of esteem, a sense of your own worth, all of this comes when you learn to implement and practice more compassion and love towards yourself. It's really hard for us to know how to do this. I completely understand and I completely resonate. I find that what helps is to remember the three elements of self-compassion. So Christine Neff, um, who is an expert in self-compassion and has given a few TED Talks and written some great books about it, she talks about mindfulness, being aware of pain before we can heal it, 
being aware of discomfort, understanding that, you know, when we're faced with mental or emotional or physical pain, it's not easy. And really witnessing the pain, you know, getting into this non-judgmental witness state of consciousness that helps us see our pain and choose to comfort and soothe it instead of, you know, reacting to it or shaming it or avoiding it or dismissing it. The second thing that she talks about is kindness. Kindness is the process of offering support and care when we're in pain. It's so, so important that when things go wrong, instead of trying to suppress the pain or betray ourselves or leap into this problem-solving mode, just imagining how would you support a friend who's suffering? What would you say to this friend? Would you call your friend an idiot? Would you start, you know, barking out orders and instructions? Or would you offer your kindness? You know, would you let them know that you care and that it's okay for them to feel everything they're feeling? So kindness is really important. And then the third thing is common humanity. So recognizing that we're not alone in our suffering. Nothing that we go through is something that we're alone in. A lot of people are going through similar issues and self-compassion helps us reframe our situation and recognize that nothing's really personal. We can actually experience a greater sense of connection, comfort and calm when we're not taking things personally and recognizing that this is just a part of the collective consciousness, you know, that suffering is a part of life. It's actually what forces us to grow, what pushes us into a deeper insight, knowledge, and awareness of ourselves. When we learn to build a relationship with uncertainty, then what happens is that we actually build a relationship with the essence of who we are. Within every decision we make lies an opportunity for growth, and it brings us one step closer to the person that we really want to be, which is that peace, you know, that peace that we majority of us want to experience and feel from within. Learning to thrive in the unknown doesn't really happen overnight. It's a process where we begin to learn how to avoid judging ourselves, how to avoid judging people. Right now, at this particular point in time, there is so much human judgment. There is so much projection of anger. There is so much reactivity going on. And so this is the shadow. This is the shadow aspect coming up to the surface. If you think about it, we live in uncertainty every single day. It's just that we haven't necessarily been as mindful of it before as we are now. Everything in life is impermanent, right? I mean, we've all heard change is the only thing that you can ever bank on. But I understand, I get it, when, when something as scary and frightening and, you know, something unknown, such as COVID, happens to us or our family members, there is this incredible fear that comes over us. The nervous system kicks in into fight and flight, and the only thing we can think of is survival. So what we need to do is to implement practices because this is not going to go away. If it's not COVID, it's going to be something else. We need to implement these practices no matter what because this is what's going to help us to build a healthier baseline. Meditation, the act and the practice of focusing, focus concentration, resting the mind, you know, reaching higher levels of awareness and consciousness. It can reduce chronic pain, heart disease, blood pressure. It can improve your nervous system. It can bring you a greater sense of peace when, you know, when done repeatedly every day, you know, when you commit to a consistent practice. Journaling, creating a conversation between your inner critic and your fearful self and your compassionate self, right? Having a conversation with yourself on paper really helps reduce stress, anxiety, depression. It helps to improve our immune system because we reduce the cloudiness of our thoughts. And then, like I said before, mindfulness. Mindfulness is when we take meditation into our everyday life. 
It's the energy that helps us to recognize the conditions of happiness that are already present in our lives, in the here and now, not in the past, not in the future. For example, every day I go outside and I look around and I say, wow, what a beautiful tree. What a beautiful flower. Wow, the sky looks great. Oh, I love the feeling of the sun on my skin or I love the smell of rain. This is how we activate mindfulness in our lives. Or the taste of that morning coffee, you know, and just really tuning in to the tiny little things, even just the sound of the birds chirping in the first thing in the morning when I wake up, or the sound of gentle piano, soft piano music playing. All of these things help me feel more connected to myself and life around me. And these are the things that we tend to take for granted, but this is really what we need to activate within our lives, particularly at this point in time. Last thing I want to share with you guys today is that the brain doesn't differentiate between wanting to get rid of something or wanting to build. The point of focus is always addressed with more stimulation, not less. So we can only build neural maps. We can't delete them. What we focus on, we are building. If you're focusing on fear, if you're focusing on tension, self-doubt, uncertainty, you are building that. So what we want to do is we want to become active and conscious creators of our lives. And we can't do that if we get really caught up in the fear hype. I know for myself in my own life, you know, it's always been when I've been stressed that I have caught an infection or caught a cold or just anything, viral infections, viruses. It's always been stress that has lowered my immune system. But whenever I haven't felt stressed and I've really focused on maintaining, you know, a healthy um, mind, a healthy body, um, a healthy routine. Doesn't matter who I'm around, I don't actually catch whatever that person has. I don't catch the cold, I don't catch the flu, I don't catch the viral infection. And I truly believe in that. I really believe that after all the studies that I have read and things that I've learned and things that I've looked into, stress is the biggest cause of ill health. So if we reduce our level of stress around, you know, the fears um, of COVID or the uncertainties that are happening, then we're more relaxed. When the body's more relaxed, the immune system works so much better. And I know, I understand that this is mentally not easy to do. I get it. I totally get it, but it's never too late to change our brains. It's never too late to incorporate new habits and new beliefs. This is the power of neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity, which is a recent discovery in brain science, has found that our brain is constantly changing throughout our lives. No matter how old you are, you can actually sculpt new healthy pathways in the brain and prune away the old unhealthy ones. This discovery has truly changed so much because it affirms our remarkable capacity to adapt and to grow, not just when we're young, but at any time, at any stage of our lives. In every moment of our lives, we have the capacity to change the architecture of our brain. Transformation is in fact possible. Um, I know that for me, like just talking about my own life experiences, there's been some immense tragedies in my life. And I have managed to also find a sense of freedom within those tragedies. I've managed to find ease and joy to take risks, to be authentic and to be open. I've managed to overcome the fears. We fear that we can't change our habits. We doubt that it's going to make any difference. You know, we think that it's not possible. It's too overwhelming. 
but there's no truth in that. There's something really incredible about our brain. One billion calculations per second or one billion times faster than our computer. That's how fast the brain is. The brain alone comprises 1.1 trillion cells, including 100 billion neurons working together to govern different parts of our lives, from eating, sleeping, laughing, falling in love, right? There's so much that our brains are actually capable of. It's like a perfect personal assistant. It knows what needs to be done and does it without us having to ask, without us having to make it do it, right? Because it actually learns so quickly. But we have to provide training so that this personal assistant knows what to do in order to achieve the results that we're looking for. So we can consciously direct our brain by focusing on which neural pathways we want to grow and we want to develop. I love the work of Joe Dispenza because he talks a lot about how neurons that fire together, wire together. Every time neurons are activated and fire together, those neural connections grow stronger. And so when it comes to um, just creating new habits when it comes to stress reduction, when it comes to new belief systems. It's not about perfection, it's about practice. You know, practicing and starting with the little things. For example, when you're in rush hour traffic, can you just practice staying calm? Can you just practice reducing judgment in your life? Can you practice finding contentment where you are. So it's not about perfection, but it's about transformation, taking small steps every day, knowing that every moment matters and that it's never too late to change your brain. Happiness is not an easy thing to, to experience. You know, inner peace is not an easy thing to experience because most of us tend to be very poor predictors of what makes us happy. We don't actually often realize that we're missing a lot of the things that bring us a sense of joy. You know, we, we're skipping over things, the everyday stuff that actually brings up us a sense of peace and happiness. And perhaps this is what the gift of this pandemic actually is, to learn and practice to live more mindfully, to live each day and be present, and to be grateful for all the little things. And this is where mindfulness comes in, because it can really help us install positive experiences in the brain, raise our happiness set point, and balance our negativity. That's why I'm so passionate about this topic with mindfulness, because I truly believe that it's the only way to face the current times of anxiety and uncertainty. I want to end this episode by taking you guys through a mindfulness exercise. I want you to begin by settling the body and the mind, perhaps sitting or lying down somewhere comfortably. And give yourself the gift of becoming present and simply just making time to tune in. See if you can allow a soft smile to rest on your lips simply inviting in rest and ease and bringing your awareness to your breathing. Just a simple sensation of breathing in and breathing out. Feeling how the breath is supporting you. Noticing what it feels like to breathe. Releasing stress and toxins with each inhale and exhale. And simply starting to sense the beating of your heart. Become aware of how the heart is supporting you. Sending blood, carrying oxygen and nutrients to all the trillions of cells in your body. 
and see if you can invite in a feeling of gratitude and kindness towards your breath, towards your heart, towards your body. Just see if you can allow your awareness to expand, to include the earth below you, supporting you. Feel yourself being held by the earth. Feel how there is very little you need to do this in this moment. Just reflect on how the earth is supporting all the beings equally. And that gravity is keeping all beings tethered to the earth. The renowned 17th century scientist Isaac Newton said that gravity is like God's love, treating each person equally. Reflect on how this earth is connected to a solar system and a vast universe, and that all things, all humans, all animals, the earth, the sun, the stars, they're all composed of the same matter, the same basic principles, which is that we are literally all made of stardust. Feel the web of life into which we're born. Feel how you are part of this web. Nothing is separate. Everything is connected. Feel yourself resting in the heart of the universe. And just take a moment to send good wishes to all beings perhaps gently, silently repeating to yourself, may all beings be peaceful, may all beings be safe and protected, may all beings be happy, may all beings be filled with love and kindness. And then recognize that you are contained within the good wishes for all beings. So put your attention once again on yourself, the being sitting here, and then silently direct the good wishes to yourself. May I be peaceful. May I be safe and protected. May I be happy. May I be filled with love and kindness. And as you breathe in, just imagine that you're breathing in this loving kindness. And that as you're breathing out, you're sending this loving kindness out. May all beings here and everywhere dwell with peace. May the earth dwell in peace. May this practice be of benefit for all beings. I love this quote by Rumi where he says, You're not a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. We all belong to each other. We are all connected. So when we send out good wishes, it, there's, there's this web of intention that affects all of us. This is what we call the collective consciousness. When you practice mindfulness, when you practice self-compassion, you are literally making the world a better place. Separateness is an optical delusion of consciousness. When we transform ourselves, we literally create echoes in the universe for transformation. All right, everybody, that's it for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you're interested in working with me, please visit mentalawakening.com.au. If you love this episode, please subscribe and leave me a review. This will help more people to receive the information that is being shared here and to have access to it. I wish you all a wonderful 
week ahead and I am intending to be back again in two weeks time now that things have settled down a bit for me with a brand new episode. Until then, take care everybody. Bye for now.